Roxy, welcome back. Ta da! <laughs> All right, doing a show, buddy. All right, let's do this. Welcome to this week's episode of the Max's Super Awesome Comic Review Show. I am Max, and with me, as most of the time, is my co-host, Foxy. Hello. Good to have you back, Foxy. I've been here this whole time. Well, I mean, good to have you back on this side of the camera. Okay, there you go. You look, you look so so beautiful on camera. You're, I'm dashing, You're right? wasted off screen. That's right. Yeah, well, adorable in that sweater, dashing in, like, maybe a vest. Yeah, I'll get a vest. Don't worry about you it. You get one. Yeah. Right after you cosplay as, uh... Forever Carlisle. That's gonna totally happen. The costuming department has no time. They were too busy building a miniature Foxy action figure. We'll cut to a close up at this point. It's a prototype. It's a prototype for action figure. It's gonna make us billions, America. Well, anyway, we got we got a pretty loaded episode for you this week. A, a good lineup on the top five. We got a previews watch, and then Twitter has been driving me insane uh, for the last hour since I learned about this story. So we're gonna have a discussion about why Twitter is the worst thing in the world. And or, why Avengers Age of Ultron, not that bad. In fact, yeah, I loved it. Uh, I mean, if you're aware of this story, great, stick around, enjoy the conversation. If this is like all news to you and you're like, what are they talking about? It'll be the last segment of the show. We'll get into it. It'll be groovy. But before that, we got to get through the top five. <laughs> top five, everybody! <laughs> Coming in at number five from uh, Valiant Comics, uh, written by Alice Cott, who... Writes the craziest <laughs> comics on the racks. <laughs> yeah. More and more, I've come to enjoy his comics. Um, this one's great. There's a virus on the loose in the city, and it's going to take all of the Valiant superheroes to to bring it down and to catch it. But nothing's really as it seems, and you're not sure who's pulling what string. So it's it's going to be a wild ride. The first issue, what's that action movie I'm thinking of where uh, Jason Statham? Speed. Speed, yeah. No. <laughs> Oh, you're thinking about the one with his heart has a bomb in yeah, it? Yeah, where he's like always got a drink. Oh, energy what is that? Stuff. Yeah. It sounds like an energy drink. It's like fueled or zap or something, some crappy. But it's like that movie. Uh, coming in at number four, we have Rocket Girl issue number six. This is the first issue. Uh, in over a year, right? Or Yeah. So they wrote some more and it's back. That's awesome. Amy Reader's art is fantastic. The story is great. It's about a 15-year-old future space cop who's stuck in the past. Good in story. the 80s. 1980s New York yeah. City. Yeah, Brooklyn. Represent. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would recommend pick, picking up the paperback. Um, if you don't want to pick up the paperback and you just want to jump in on the first issue of the new arc, that's cool too. They do a good job catching you up. They're not just going to throw you into the deep end. It's coming in at number three. We have Afterlife with Archie issue number eight. Um, different... Different Afterlife with Archie than the other issues have been. This one's got like a real campfire horror story kind of feel to it. As we learn that this is not the first time terrible things have happened to Riverdale. Uh, there's one scene where like Archie's having a heart to heart and like they're at this bar and you're like, yeah, and then he's like, give me a root beer. Can I get some ice cream in that? <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Drop the mic, Archie. Badass. Oh, it was awesome. It's a great place. If you've never checked out any of the Afterlife with Archie's, this is a great place to start reading because it's all just a bunch of little short stories. And the artwork is just cool and creepy for it. Uh, speaking of cool and creepy, coming in at number two, we have Baltimore, The Cult of the Red King. I don't know if this is going to be the final story arc, but it's definitely going to build up to it because we're getting closer and closer to the mega baddie. If you've never read any of the Baltimore stuff, I mean, I would highly recommend starting at the beginning. You could be like me and you jump in at the middle and going back and catching up on it. The Cult of the Red King does a really good job of introducing you to a bunch of characters and kind of giving you enough of a background on them and how they fit into Baltimore's life and why Baltimore is doing what he's doing that you can just run, run with it. And they're all five issue chapters, so it's not like you're signing up for a huge long commitment of confusion. Like, you're gonna get it right away and you're gonna enjoy it right away. They're all great. But not as great as our number one this week, and that's why it's number one, because <gasps> it's Secret Wars issue number one. Honestly, I was excited to read this anyway, but still surprised me at how good it was. It was, like, legitimately really good. I got Heart emotional a couple times. Yeah, I laughed, I cried. You I did not cry. There were, some, there were some truly sad moments. Some characters, some big characters seemingly died. Yeah. And... Not seemingly. They looked pretty dead. They looked pretty dead, but you know, it's, it's comics, it's Marvel, Well, we know we're going to come out the other side of this with a new universe, so they're not going to be dead forever. But, but maybe. That might have been the death of six, some of the 616 characters, because yeah. Battleworld is composed of a lot of characters from various worlds. It's true. 
So they may be legitimately dead, and we will see their character in another form, but mm. maybe maybe that's the last we see of those guys. Yeah. And Which is pretty intense. Doom! Oh my god, those first three pages, I was just like, yes! This is gonna be awesome. Who is it Man. that talks to God? It is Doom! Doom! <laughs> Doom dares. Yeah, awesome. I mean, the hype was not overhyped. This book is awesome. And yeah, this is legit. This is like what event books are supposed to be. Yeah, this is this is better than, this is a better first issue of an event book than I've ever read before from Marvel. You but and you liked ABX. So you I love ABX. But I, this is stronger than that. I I mean it, this felt like the stakes were real. Like even ABX took a little while for me to be like, okay, the stakes are real in this. And even coming out of that, it felt like the whole time I was like, yeah, but something's going to happen and this world is going to be fine and it's going to go back to the way it was. This they're like, no, there's no going back. This world is dying. Yeah. That universe is going away, and we're coming out of the other side with something brand new. I, so. I, I would agree with that sentiment. It really did feel like the stakes were real. Yeah. And it's, you know, and that's a they're putting their money where their mouth is on that. They're, yeah. they're changing everything. And All of their publication schedules, <laughs> everything is great. Um, let's do some graphic novels real quick. Uh, three that came out this week. The first one is Southern Bastards Volume 2. It's out. We've talked about every single issue of that series, so... Because it's that good. It is that good. And you know what I noticed today while I was um, at the shop selling that book to people? Volume 2, still only nine ninety nine. What? Yeah. They've never done that. Uh, no, I've never seen a series do that. That's awesome. Well, you know, and it's appropriate, too, because that one is, uh, again, four issues, right? Right, yeah. I mean, they're small graphic novels, but still, like... That's awesome, because yeah. I was expecting a $15 graphic novel. Oh, you can get, get all of Southern Bastards for 20 bucks. Right on. How cool is that? Good job, guys. Yeah. Way to go, Jason Aaron. Writing a good book and being nice to the fans. Yeah, Jason Aaron's like, I don't need to get them for an extra five bucks. I'm Jason Aaron. I'm writing Thor, Thor man. <laughs> <laughs> Next up on our list of graphic novels, it is Yusagi Ojimbo Senso. Yeah, it's like um, Yusagi Ojimbo meets uh, War of the Worlds. Yeah, it's what if War of the Worlds had happened in feudal Japan. Boom. And feudal awesome. Japan was populated by samurai rabbits. Only one samurai rabbit. Oh, okay. Well, there's a problem. I bet there's more. You know. So, uh, <laughs> most importantly on our graphic novel list this week, it is Jim Henson's Storyteller. Which is available now in hardcover. I believe we also talked about every issue of this book. Enough of them that you should know that it's amazing by now. But it is really cool. It is definitely my favorite Jim Henson comic storyteller thing they've put out. Totally, yeah. Contributions from Jeff Stokely, mm -hmm. S.M. Fadari, and a couple of other people. Yeah, I'm sure there's some other people as fine. But those are the so. two that really, you know, hooked me. Yeah. Each issue is its own self-contained thing. Yeah, so they're it's all, four different stories. They're all beautifully illustrated. Each story is fantastic. And they all take a very different visual approach as yeah. well. And they're very different witches too, so it works. Works on all levels. Go buy it. Yep. Um, that's it for new stuff. Let's talk about some previous stuff. Yeah, previews watch. Previews watch. We stand on guard. Yeah. Brian K. Vaughn's new uh, series. Which at first I was like, weird, Canadian Army? Not a real thing. Yeah, I don't know if I care about Canadian war stories. I thought it was going to be a historical text. No, they've never fought a war. I'm yeah. sorry if there's any Canadians out there that find this fun. Turns out, it's speculative fiction about giant robots from America attacking Canadian soil. So I'm going to read that. Yeah, <laughs> way awesome. And uh, I've never heard of the artist before, Steve Scorse, but I guess... He did the uh, like concept art for Matrix or some some movie. I've never really heard of the Matrix. I don't know. It's a thing, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Keanu Reeves, surfboards. Yeah, I vaguely remember. No, that. that's Point Break. Yeah, I don't know. Something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, but the preview pages look beautiful. So. Totally. Yeah, and I'm on board. I've never known Vaughn to pair with an artist that he didn't feel like could capture his full story. And I've never read a Bond story that wasn't, like, awesome, except for maybe The End of Lost, but whatever. He didn't write The End of Lost. <laughs> he, he consulted in the writer's room, and then when he left, everything went off the rails. Yeah. Every Desmond episode can be attributed to his genius. That's true. That's so, true. there you go. No, it's a new Brian K. Bond story. What else do you need to say about it? Yeah. Next up, did you did you check out the uh, Frank Frazetta's Adventures of the Snowman? Dude, I had no idea that he ever did something like that before. But it's like, yeah, it's his first. It was his first work. Yeah, his first uh, long form comic story, never been published before. Never been published. And so, it does not look like the swords and sorcery stuff that we're, he's known no, for. It's not the Death Dealer. <laughs> so yeah, I'm totally gonna check that out because Frazetta doing cartooning. Yeah, adorable snowman. It's cool. I'm sure that there's going to be some dark themes to it because that's how he rolls. Guaranteed, guaranteed. But, but yeah, it looks which will be a nice amazing. subversion of the visual. So yeah, yeah. 
Uh, next up on my list, James Stokoe's first issue in the Godzilla and Hell series. Yeah. It's going to be five issues, each issue by a different uh, creative team. I don't know if everyone is written and drawn by a writer-artist like Stokoe. I but... hope they stick, like, at least maybe visually in one vein, you know? Yeah, well, each, each issue is going to be a different level of Hell, kind of like Dante's Inferno style. That I don't know how you must descend yeah. or rise out of. Godzilla is descending into Dante, Dante's Inferno. I don't know if he's going to have like inner monologue or how they do that. <laughs> but that's really, I'm on board just for Stoko alone, and then we'll see about two through five. <laughs> I hope that he now monologues the entire thing. But however they do it, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but it's going to be cool. From Image, we've got uh, Island number one. Uh, yes. from, that's Brandon Graham and uh, Emma Rios and uh, and others. Others, yeah. It's an, a new anthology series. It's uh, twenty to thirty page stories, three of them, uh, and they're from around the world. And this first one has Kelly Sue DeConnick doing a text piece as the accompaniment, but every subsequent issue will be a different third wheel. Probably not all text. Probably not all text. I'm assuming that most of them will be comics. We'll see what Kelly Sue has to say for 30 pages. Another image offering, there. it's a reprint of Rick Remender and Greg Tuccini's first work together, The Last Days of American Crime, mm -hmm. uh, described as smutty sci-fi noir. So I know you'll be reading it. I love all of those things. Yeah. And most of low, is your, low is your favorite of the Remender books, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. If you're a low fan, if you're a fan of smutty <laughs> sci-fi noir, there you go. All right. <laughs> then I think the most exciting things coming from Marvel, uh, Civil War is one of the like Battle World Warzone books, and uh, that's Charles Soule and Lionel Francis Yu. Mm -hmm. um, and in the concept there is that Civil War never ended. It's been going for six years. I punch you in the face, Captain America. I punch you in the face, Iron Man. And now Tony Stark is the president, I think, and Captain America is the general of an army. Sounds pretty crazy. I'm excited. For and that. Charles Soule. Has yet to really disappoint. So yeah, he's a, he's yeah he's a consistently good storyteller, and that's what this story requires. So I'm gonna roll with it. He took over for Scott Snyder on Swamp Thing and did a, a fantastic job with that. Yeah, and the Inhuman stuff has been great. So and uh, She Hulk was oh, actually yeah, -Hulk I, I loved She Hulk. Uh, he's also writing the new Star Wars Lando Calrissian book. Alex Maleev is doing the art. So. It's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be cool. It's gonna be about Lando. And it's about huh? Lando, and Charles is writing it. So yep, yep. Gonna sell out on number one, they're going to second print before number two comes out. I'm calling it. Yep. Because that's what happened with every other Star Wars book. Then we've got uh, The Spire, number one. Oh, oh my god, that book looks so cool. Simon Spurrier and Jeff Stokely, the team that brought you Six Gun Gorilla, which I love. Awesome book. So good. Um, and it's it says basically it's for fans of East of West and The Dark Crystal. Nobody likes those things. Yeah. Who likes those things? Yeah. Moving uh, on. Me. Don't bore me with this anymore. <laughs> me? And that one's an eight issue everybody, series. Everybody loves it. Looks really good. Devil's Do, putting out another book uh, on the heels of Square Ears, which we love. The same team that brought you that. Ash Maxo and Ashley Witter. What'd you uh, call me? <laughs> <laughs> They're doing a, a, a book called Scorch, uh, Volume 1 trade paperbacks coming out. And, and this one's about a teenage teenage girl made a deal with a devil. To, to become be, immortal? Yeah, to become immortal, but she keeps her powers and saves the world by meeting a quota of like 10,000 souls that she has to like give to this other guy. I mean, and just the one image that you see of like her in the little demon suit is adorable. Oh yeah, and the demon lives in her closet, so. Oh yeah, the demon that she owes the souls to lives cool. in the closet. That's gotta be cool. <laughs> Monsters in the closet, it's gotta, it's gotta go. Then, uh, last but definitely not least, from first second books, Asa Fanuka, who just released that uh, realist collection, is the artist of another book called The Divine. Uh, he didn't write this one, but it sounds amazing. It's uh, what was it? A former, like a former military soldier who's now doing like private contracting as like an explosive expert kind of thing. Yeah, but really, it's about him going to a South Asian uh, country, and it sounds like he's going to Kunlun, a magical land where he's it caught in the battle between these two uh, twin children that are commanding armies of uh, gods, gods, and a dragon. Yeah. And it's Aesop Panuka's beautiful art executing it all, so... Yeah, I mean... This book is gonna be awesome. This is another one that's gonna sell out. <laughs> yeah. That's well, it for Previews Watch. That's it for Previews Watch. We're gonna have a brief cutaway, and then we're gonna come back for a discussion of all things ridiculous. I just found out about it. This week's crazy. Find out. This week's crazy, bro. It's crazy.
Foxy, I've decided to replace you with this smaller, pocket-sized, more adorable version of you. All right. Nah, I would never eat me. I'm too cute. Yeah, you're adorable. This version of you, anyway. Ha! Things that are not adorable. Things, yeah. Twitter lynch mobs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Twitter lynch mobs. Not the first time we've addressed you, Twitter lynch mobs. No, seriously. People, it's great that we all have a social media platform that we can, like, engage everybody on. But it's not appropriate when that conversation deteriorates from actually having a point or making a statement to hatred, hatred, death threats, more hatred, and ignorance. That is not the world that we live in, people. This is the 21st century. We should live in a world where we can have a civil discourse about anything that we would like to have a civil discourse about. Totally. You don't have to agree with me. No. But so, when you disagree with me, don't threaten my life. Don't yeah. threaten to curb stomp me. Don't call me hate, hateful, vitriolic names. If you disagree with my opinion, state an opinion of your own. The fact that you're going to curb stomp me, not an opinion. Not an opinion. So, we're talking about Avengers Age of Ultron came out. I went and saw it as a fan, and you went and saw it as a fan, and as casual fans, we were like, that was a cool movie. Yesterday, you found some crazy... Yeah, How did this I had heard... to the beginning. I had heard there were complaints. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you should stop watching now, because I'm not going to worry about spoiling it. Oh, yeah. No. I'm going to spoil the hell out of this movie. We're past that. Spoiler alert's coming up. Turn it off if you don't want spoilers. Um, but yeah, I, I assume there would be maybe continuity complaints, or like, that's not how they did it in the comic, or, you know, Quicksilver, he's my favorite. You yeah. Know, why, why, you know, I assumed there would be complaints. I mean, there's always complaints. I also everything. assumed that they would be mostly motivated by not wanting to be, like, into the cool thing. You know, like, it's yeah. cool to hate on something that's popular. It's called being a hipster. Yeah. Hipsterism, another <laughs> issue. We're not going to directly address that one. But basically, I thought that's what was at, at fault yeah, here. And that's reasonable. Yeah. But what did you find? Um, I found really, really missing the mark, like, illogical, hate-spewing... The like, worst. You found the worst. I found the worst. And, like, accusing uh, Joss Whedon of being a misogynist and... Um, representations of Black Widow being, um, like, anti-feminist and making her into a damsel in distress and equating, um, infertility to being a monster. Yeah. We found, like, three things that were, like, the, the big problems that we noticed. And the big trends. Yeah. So that people were latching on to. That Black Widow is a damsel, that Joss Whedon is insensitive to, it compares women that can't have babies to being monsters, and what was the third one? It was, um, oh yes, uh, that Tony Stark makes a rape joke. Oh yeah, the rape joke. We're going to dispel all of these rumors right here and now because I'm not the biggest Joss Whedon fan. I love to look at things in his movies that I can like nitpick and like throw in Joss Whedon fans' faces. To yeah, I mean, Aha! you were totally, you saw it, you did see it I, a second time this weekend it. in order to just poke to do holes that. in just it. Just to do it, because it was fun. Um, and... None of these complaints, I find, have any basis in the movie. Anything that these complaints are saying is completely just opinionated and speculative. Starting with the first one. Uh, we'll start with comparing the Black Widow's character as a damsel in distress in general. Yeah, I, get, I mean, in the final, one of the final, the final act of the movie, she is, like, kidnapped by Ultron. Yep. And then has to be rescued. You got in prison being a mega badass by like... Being the only one that really got the mission accomplished yeah. in the previous scene. Right. Everybody else is kind of screwing it up. Black Widow goes and gets it done. She, and self-sacrificially. Yeah, she expected to die and instead gets captured by Ultron. Bruce Banner rescues her and is like, we gotta escape because my name is Bruce Banner and I'm a baby and blah, 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 blah. And she's like, no, I'm gonna throw you off a cliff so you become the Hulk so we can go save the day. Yeah, she's Duh. like, I'm gonna put you in the fray and then I'm gonna get in there too because this is what needs to be done. Because yeah. she's a hero, not a damsel in distress. And then uh, when they're on the cliff's edge a little bit later, a Cap's like, we're not going to, all of us aren't going to make it off here, or, or basically, like, we're not leaving anyone behind. And she's like, yeah, I'm yeah. not leaving anyone behind. We're, I assume we would all die together. But we're going to go down like heroes. So, not a damsel in distress. Yeah. In no way. No. Um, yeah, and I thought that this movie did a great job of, like, portraying, you have Hulk and Captain America and Thor and all of these, you know, and they call them numerous times, like, all of these gods. And the story 
is brought to conclusion and the day is saved by Black Widow and Hawkeye, who are just humans. Yeah, she and, was definitely the most and she's active going role. quip for quip with Captain America and Tony Stark and like all of these other characters. So don't don't tell me that she's a damsel. She's not. She saves everybody else in that movie. That's not called being a damsel. That's called being a heroine, right? Or or a hero. Or a hero, or whatever the term is. Depending on which school you're from. Yeah. It's called being a badass in my school. Yeah. Anyway. So the then, uh, the, the sterility thing. Yeah. It's another part adding to her backstory, giving yeah. her a platform in this film, giving her real pathos and emotional background. She, since childhood, was manipulated, brainwashed, and then surgically altered as a part of her training to be a top-tier assassin. Yeah. And as a result of that, it's understandable that she would have some PTSD, and that she, if she considers herself a monster as a result of what's been done to her against her will, I think that's fair. Yeah. And also, that isn't a reflection on how Joss feels about anything. That's how she feels. That's about how she feels her. about herself. The same way, it's a she's comparing herself to the Hulk to try and get Banner to understand that they relate to each other. That he views himself as a monster, even though everybody else on the team is like, "Dude, you're a hero." Without you, lots more people would die. And he's like, no, I just have this rage that I can't control. And she's like, well, I had this whole childhood and this whole past where all I did was assassinate anything that anybody told me to do, and I had no brain for myself. And my body is was also taken out of my control. Yeah. I understood that scene to be two people having a, a moment for each other to reflect on all of the things that they wish that they had more control over and being like, you know what, at least we can be, you know, monsters together. Right. Not, not, oh my god, I can't have your children, so obviously I'm a monster. And would it have been appropriate for Bruce Banner to be like, no, Natasha, you're not a monster. You know, no, I think because that beautiful. makes her a damsel. Right, that puts her in yeah. like the cliched romance. Yeah. Instead, scenario. Banner like looks at her and is like, God. Yeah, he's like, oh, we are, you know, we see each other in each other. Yeah. And that's why the next time they meet up, he does try to take that romance to the next level because he, he she made him see that they do have points to relate yeah. on. Yeah. So, which brings us to the third one. And this one, I think, is the most <sighs> ludicrous out of all of them. So, there's a scene where they're all at this big party. It was in one of the trailers, and they're all trying to pick up Thor's hammer. And Tony Stark goes to pick it up. And Tony Stark, being misogynistic Tony Stark that he is, walks up to it and says, So, if I pick it up, I get to be ruler of Asgard, and Thor says, of course, and he says, cool, first thing I'm doing is I'm reinstating Prima Nocta, which is a custom of the, like, you know, was it, 10th century world, where and potentially contested as to whether or not it actually happened, but, yeah, a custom where the king of the castle had first crack at all the new wives. But he would uh, take them sexually on yeah. their wedding night if he so desired. Now, is that wrong by our standards? Absolutely. Yes, we're in the 21st century, not the 10th century. But I don't think that this scene is to be taken as Joss Whedon saying, like, yeah, it would be great if we all had Prima Nocta. It's Tony Stark being like, hey, Thor, guess what? You're from a culture that's so screwed up and messed up that this is where that comes from to begin with. And me, being Tony Stark... I'm going to run with it and make a joke about it. Yeah, and he is a misogynist, and he is, you know, he thinks of himself as God's gift, and his track record with women does nothing to dispel that, you know? Yeah. He, he gets what he wants from the women he wants it from. By and, seducing them with money and power. Right, which is a pretty successful strategy, and, uh, you know... Both. But I don't think, I think it was a self-effacing joke, like Tony Stark being like, I'm the kind of guy that would do that. But also, I do think he's the kind of guy that would go into the wedding tent and be like, you want a piece of this? Yeah. I'm Expecting full gift. well that you might. And then if you didn't, he'd, he'd leave, because he's not a rapist. He's yeah. just got, he's uncouth. Yeah. But they didn't explore that, because why the hell would they explore that? Yeah. It was, yeah, it's... It's not a statement that the, the writer of the film or the director of the film is making. It's, just, it's not even a statement that the character is making. It's... Not, a, in, not like in jest. It's a yeah. joke. And it, maybe it's a joke in poor taste. Certainly not as in poor taste as Chris Evans and Jeremy Renner calling Black Widow a whore. Which, that was a misstep. Yeah. But again, they were, they were not... It was not mean-spirited, but we should be moving away from that kind of humor. Sure. Prima sure. Nocta... Honestly, went over my head. 
I heard it and I was like, I know I've heard those words before, but I don't remember what they mean right now. And then I was on to the next joke and I didn't internalize it. My, when I heard it, I was like, wait, since when does Asgard, Asgard not have that? So, <laughs> wouldn't that always be a part of Asgard? Like, that's their culture. That's 9th century Vikings. Uh, so yeah, I was like, ha, Tony Stark getting, getting one over on Thor. But really, it's like stupid intellectual like historical humor uh, yeah and i find all of the people that that are just riding this pan what is you can read some of these quotes here and i have to edit them because they're no they're I'll just, a, well we'll put them up on the screen if you don't want to see curse words or hear them then yeah. you know get away from here f you joss whedon you effed up the only female superhero that marvel has allowed us to have the black widow isn't an effing damsel so Marvel only allowed us to have Black Widow. Yeah, no, that's the only one you got. Scarlet Witch wasn't in the movie, apparently. No, nope, neither was Maria Hill. No, neither was Maria Hill. And, uh, oh, apparently Marvel doesn't publish comics because yeah. they've only made this Avengers movie. Let me see. Let me run down the list of books that I read this week for Marvel. I read Secret Wars. Okay, that had a lot of female characters in it. We could go into detail, but we don't have that much time in the day. Uh, aside from that, I read Squirrel Girl. I read Spider Girl. I read Spider Woman. There's three right there. And wow. Yeah. That was that was today. That was today's book. Would I like to see a Black Widow standalone film? Yes. Absolutely. Especially after this. Never before have I more wanted to see a standalone Black Widow film as after watching Age of Ultron yeah. because we really got into her character. Yeah. And she was a badass. Awesome badass. The only thing I didn't get about her was her Tron her Tron stripes on her suit. Yeah, we needed more Tron stripe yeah. uh, and also Tron baton play. Like, yeah, let's, let's talk she had those for like one that. second. I was like, where did those come from? Those are cool. Can yeah. I have one? <laughs> and do I wish that Captain Marvel appeared at the end of this film? Yes. As Joss intended? Yes. Yes. Yes, I do. Do I wish the Captain Marvel film was slated to come out sooner? Yes. Do I wish Black Widow already had her film? I don't know. Like, on one hand, yes, because then we'd already have a, fil a female-led uh, superhero movie. I would say no. Because but Black Widow wasn't as fully established as she is now, and I think Joss did a exactly. great job setting her up, and now any film that comes out will have that under its belt. Yeah. There's a difference between rushing out a, a female-led superhero movie because you need to have a female... Yeah, just to be like, first, right. first oh, commenter. You know, that's how you get, like, Halle Berry Catwoman. And honestly, Black Widow has never been like the premier Marvel character. No, so they wouldn't, I was amazed they wouldn't that she even made it into the Avengers lineup when the first yeah. one came out, I was like Black Widow. Like weird, but cool because you know, Assassin, that's cool. Like Thor and Iron Man are more like recognizable properties and yeah. I can imagine Black Widow being more of an untested property. At this point, it's been tested. I would I, you know, they could have done it. They're they're stalling. There were there were I'm sure there are reasons that we can't really defend, yeah. but we don't know. I'm not in Disney Studios. I don't know the full reasons, but it's clear that Joss prioritizes this character because he made her the lead character of the movie. Yeah. Her and uh, Jeremy Renner, it was like an apology to him for not having a character in Avengers 1, for yeah. being evil zombie number one. <laughs> right. And yeah, I just, it frustrates me because... This this lynch mob that's coming after Avengers 2 Age of Ultron, if if there are complaints, let's have them in a discourse where we can actually get to the fundamental problem and we can, we can form a solution and we can have a discussion as fans that revolves around the things that we would like to see done differently or the things that in the future we can build upon. Not just... Well, hold on. Yeah, read another quote Not, there. Uh, still, fuck you, or block me, bitch, or speaking of Joss Whedon, thanks for equating being sterile to being a monster, you piece of shit. Uh, did you guys notice the rape joke? I'll kill you, Joss Whedon. Yeah, death threats and calling him what I would consider terms of misogynist yeah. nature, you know, we're complaining about misogyny and then calling him a bitch? I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. Also, can you just read that, uh, that other one? Because i got to personally oh, yeah. address this guy. Yeah, you do. Reservoir Doges. Joss Whedon, you ugly ass big bird looking bitch. Stop ruining everything you touch. Now, honestly, here, what do you have against Big Bird? Because if you tell me I look like Big Bird, I'm going to think you're telling me I look like a beautiful, luminous, like, feathered, awesome thing. I don't know. I mean, it blows my mind because on the one hand, you're attacking the man for being insensitive towards, like, a certain group of people, and then 
by, in your attack, you're going to single him out for being a female, by calling him a bitch, uh, for being uh, ugly, which, come on, what are you, 12? And also, like, yeah, yeah, Big Bird! Like, what does Big Bird have to do with it? Ugly Lady Big Bird. It's like, well, uh, in every way that's so offensive. And speaking of Big Bird, let's end this on a high note. We're not going to talk about misogyny anymore. We're nope. done. Done with it. Twitter lunch mob, we're done. But Big Bird has a new documentary out. And I Am Big Bird is also for everybody. It's available on iTunes and Amazon Video. And it's the Carol Spinney story. If you saw that Being Elmo movie a couple years back, okay. that, that movie just totally inspired them to make this one, I Am Big Bird. Cool. And Carol Spinney is a mensch, man. That guy has been playing Big Bird for over 40 years. He's an elderly man at this point. That's awesome. Never, he's never going to put that mantle down until, he, until his last breath. And I, I respect it. that. I love it. So, go watch I Am Big Bird to clear your mind of all of this hate, and let's just, like, have some reasonable discussions where we can all respect each other. And the next time you want to take to Twitter and have a discussion, have a discussion, America. Yeah, no hate. Leave it on the bench. Until next time, stay off the haterade.